Ladies and gentlemen of the Shrek Gaming Center.com video, we have a hell of a lot of details concerning both Pascal and Volta, which of course are the next generation GPUs from NVIDIA. Pascal, as many of you know, will be the successor to the Maxwell architecture, and it does appear that um, Pascal will indeed be on store shelves at some point in the first half of 2016. So these details were unveiled at SC. 15, which is a supercomputing conference, the international conference for high performance computing, networking, storage, and pretty much anything else actually under the sun. So how do we know this stuff? Well, as I said, NVIDIA have been rather boastful and they have shared a lot of um, nuggets, I guess you could say, of um, wisdom concerning the next generation chips. So first of all, a few smaller pieces of news, the GPU is pretty much all but confirmed to be using a 16FF process at this point by TSMC. I say all but confirmed because NVIDIA have confirmed during the conference that it is using 16NM, but we're not still 100% certain regarding TSMC. It's pretty much confirmed, but Business Career, who originally posted the article, have now removed it because of confidentiality reasons. So, yes, it's technically confirmed, but the evidence of the confirmation has now been removed in the temporary, but obviously it's the internet. You can never get rid of uh, something once you've posted it. But this means that naturally we're going to see a rather large gains over the previous generation of the maxwell architecture it means that maxwell's around 8 billion transistors are going to be absolutely dwarfed by 16 billion from pascal naturally this also means compared to a 28 nm process we're going to be seeing massive improvements for example 65 percent higher clocks around two times the density or 70 percent less power draw compared to once again 28 nm which is absolutely gargantuan. But the insanity really comes down to the double precision compute performance of both Pascal and Volta. So just to give you an idea of where we are currently, the Tesla K80 accelerator, which features two GK210s, has a peak performance of around 2.91 T-flops. This is and Pretty much all of the stars align. Meanwhile, AMD, not to be left out in the cold, uh, their top of the range Fire Pro S9170, once again with peak double precision, that's FP64, is rated at about 2.62 teraflops. Now, that's a lot considering, once again, it is double precision. 2.62 teraflops, not bad. But. According to NVIDIA's slides and what they are boasting, that's going to be dwarfed by what they're going to manage to put out with the next generation GPUs. Pascal supposedly peaks at over 4 teflops of performance. That's a lot, but even that is nothing compared to the absolute crazy insanity that is Volta. Volta, once again in double precision 64, hits over 7 T-flops of performance. That is absolutely bonkers. And memory bandwidth as well absolutely skyrockets, with peak memory bandwidth going up way over 1.2 terabytes per second with Volta. Now obviously there are some problems with high bandwidth memory too, and we'll get into that in just a second. But if you compare this to an x86 CPU, that would be the same processor that's most likely in your desktop unless you're running like a, you know, an old school Macintosh. It's absolutely crazy. It's, you know, basically the line now is just getting quite literally vertical in terms of precision, uh, sorry, in terms of raw performance. And obviously desktop that's moving towards DDR4 and all this, but you know, it's like, eh, who cares? It's nothing compared to the performance of high-end GPUs, and that's just how um, GPUs are structured. So what does that mean? Because, okay, a lot of that is down to compute performance, and that's great, but what if you're not running physics simulations on your PC? I mean, you might do. How do I know what you're doing? But 
let's just assume you're fragging people. What about just regular gaming, that type of thing? Well, obviously this is speculation. At the end of the day, we don't have NVIDIA's confirmations, but of confirmation, confirmations, what the hell? But we don't have them confirming any numbers right now. But if we see double precision of over 40 flops, it's probable that Pascal's high-end GPUs are going to hit over 10 T-flops. That's absolutely incredible. And I'll leave it to your imagination what Volta would be capable of. I mean, Volta is just going to be just off the charts. It's going to absolutely decimate anything. Now, I'm not trying to take anything away from AMD. We don't know what they will be capable of. And it's very likely, from what we've heard, that it's going to be tit for tat, so to speak. From what we can see from Arctic Islands, and once again, not exactly a great deal of information available. It's looking like it will be very similar in terms of raw performance. Now, all of this is obviously going towards heterogeneous performance. Everyone who's heard anything about my PlayStation 4 videos knows about this. It's one of the benefits of consoles. It's really easy for them to be able to share workloads between the CPU and the GPU. Essentially, with the consoles, let's say the PlayStation 4, because it's a really easy one to, to get around, simply because it does have one large pool of memory. You don't have to worry about the ES RAM, which some compute work can be done on ES RAM, from what I understand. But typically, it's not really used for that. DDR3 is. But for the PlayStation 4, it has one large pool of GDDR5. Now, essentially, the PlayStation 4's CPU and GPU, but the AMD Jaguar and the uh, GPU itself, which of course is uh, GCN based, that's from AMD, they see the same memory space. So, for the sake of argument, they can both access the same memory address. There are some caveats here they can't access it simultaneously the cpu has to wait for the gpu to process a piece of data or vice versa but essentially speaking you don't have like two types of container which a lot of systems do um, in let's say the playstation 3 that wasn't the case you have a dedicated memory for the gpu dedicated memory for the cpu and yes the playstation 4 um you know really benefits from that but pcs are moving towards that more and more with high-end compute becoming kind of important in gaming especially for certain effects for example tress effects uses obviously the gpu to run that uh, you've got even things such as lighting now uses compute you've got even the next generation of virtual reality will be using compute to, let's say, calculate the warping of an image. All of this stuff is going to become critical for gamers, whether you're interested in the highest frames per second of the latest Call of Duty, to, once again, running simulations of the Big Bang and the universe as a whole. Computer is going to become more important, more important, and Nvidia really stressed this. They said that you know improvements to the system, improvements to memory, improvements to the interconnect between how the CPU and the GPU talk to one another. And this isn't just software related; it's down to the hardware, it's down to the programming techniques. All of this is going to become critical. CPUs aren't particularly efficient with how they do things. We've known this for some time. They basically waste a lot of time. Uh, calculating how and what to do rather than actually doing it it's like I guess the best way to describe it in layman's terms and this is vastly simplifying it is it's kind of like that person who's really good at planning but not really good at actually implementing and doing the work versus that person who just gets stuck in which is the GPU but they don't necessarily plan the work so Sometimes they'll get like halfway through the job before they realize uh, actually that's kind of wrong. Now, CPUs, therefore, they will spend a lot of time figuring out what order they should be doing a certain task in. They, send, they spend a lot of time actually calculating all of that, issuing instructions, but they don't necessarily spend time actually executing and doing the calculations. GPUs, therefore, can have large latency, but they make up for the latency in pure raw throughput. 
And latency is something the GPUs are getting better at. DirectX 12 and other such APIs and the CPU actually being involved in these uh, decisions and better filling the bubbles in the GPU's pipeline. Essentially all the bubble is, just once again for layman's talk and to keep this video re fairly brief, it's basically little bits of workload on certain uh, cores in a, process, in, a, in a GPU. So let's say for the sake of argument, you have 1024 stream processors in a, pr in a GPU. Just for the sake of argument, let's just say a GCN based GPU has 1024 stream processors for the sake of argument. Each of those will be carrying out various tasks, whether it's shading, whether it's tessellation, whether it's figuring out, I don't know, how a shadow looks, whether it's even something more mundane. Each one of those will be doing various tasks and they will be uh, basically assigned various workloads by the system's CPU and then that will be the, basically the CPU the GPU is told what to do and then it will assign the workloads it feels best over the stream process over the resources it has available but in current systems there is definitely bubbles which effectively means that essentially some of those resources for small slices of time are going to waste so that's how GPUs are definitely going to become more efficient. It just somewhat makes up for it simply because of massive, massive, massive parallelism. So essentially you're getting thousands potentially of processors all working together to actually calculate a specific task. And NVIDIA realized this, and AMD as well, and they are going to be fixing this. They're moving to a much more compute orientated focus. And eventually they believe anyway that things are going to become absolutely crazy they believe that energy efficiency is going to become a big deal and they're going to start to create by around 2023 they say that they're going to create exas exascale systems and those are going to have massive numbers of heterogeneous nodes and they're going to have basic optimized cores um, and essentially they're going to be doing the bulk of the heavy lifting while the CPU is going to be focused just on sequ sequential processing. So essentially, the CPU is going to be left to do the things it's best at and the GPU is going to be left to do the things it's best at. AMD have been working on this for some time as well. It re works really well for consoles because of the very, very, very tight power constraints they've got. But naturally, this is going to be improved and improved and improved and improved over the next couple of years until absolute insanity. Speaking of power, and I do want to point this out, we all heard about high bandwidth memory, right? I actually had an interview with Robert Halleck from AMD, and he stated that one of the big reasons that they are moving towards um, HBM and why AMD started to pioneer HBM was simple. It is power constraints it basically becomes very inefficient to run tons and tons and tons of chips at low at high clock speeds not just because it eats a lot of power but also it starts to eat a lot of board space so therefore it's better to run chips at slower clock speeds for the sake of argument 500 megahertz but have them at a really wide bus so it kind of makes up for the for the deficit the problem is this is not going to work forever in a day eventually you're going to run into a situation where the actual wattage of running hbm2 at high high clocks starts to get absolutely crazy for example running uh hbm2 at the frequencies required at the at the numbers required to run at or provide 1.2 terabytes per second which is the bandwidth supposedly of Volta, it's going to add about 60 watts to the power envelope of a standard everyday GPU. Now, currently HBM1, uh, just to give you a point of reference, for Fiji is about 40 watts. So, obviously, we need to continue to go towards a higher and higher and higher clock speeds, and eventually, we're going to want to see things such as 2 terabytes per second of memory bandwidth for, let's say two and a half terabytes per second and so on because naturally the, the higher number of, the, of processors on a GPU the more memory bandwidth it consumes it just kind of well that's just kind of a standard right so what does that mean for us as 
us as customers, us as gamers, us as you know developers or whatever the hell you're going to be doing a lot whether you're going to be an AMD fan, whether you're an Nvidia fan, whether you just don't care and you just want the best performance for your money which to be honest I think is the best camp to be in it's going to be insane over the next couple of years I think in about two to three years time we're going to have hardware which absolutely dwarfs what we are at now and I I've said this for some time I believe currently in 2015 at the time I'm recording this in November I don't know how it's already November but that's beside the point I think we're in this really bizarro land like the whole of 2015 to be honest I've felt like this I felt that we're in this really weird ass no man's land where we're still on four core CPUs typically unless you want to go say Broadwell you, we're in this really weird ass position of GPUs where yes, Maxwell, not crap, not bad, a very good GPU in terms of power efficiency, but not that much better than let's say you had a high-end Titan or a 780 Ti, something like that. A lot of people just could not be bothered to upgrade to Maxwell a 980. 980 Ti is fairly arguable, but if you had a 780 Ti, was it worth moving to a, a 980? Probably not. 980 tie yes if you're going for very high resolution gaming you're planning to SLI but other than that if you've got say a 780 tie SLI probably not if you've got a 29 a, a 29 let me start again an R9 290X or something along those lines is it worth upgrading to the 390 series the 390X probably not the Fury is a very good card but 4 gigabytes of memory it's a really weird position in the market, at least in my opinion. And even Skylake, it's not bad, but once again, the four cores kind of make it a bit weird. And, you know, DDR4 prices are starting to fall, certainly, but DirectX 12 is not a big thing at the moment. Obviously, it's going to become a big thing in the next couple of years. So, basically, I've said a whole lot of words, but my point being, they're in this really weird position gaming-wise, where... To be honest, a lot of the games, they're going to be like, yeah, you need like five Titans and SLI and your ass better have something along the lines of a minimum of a 6700K overclocked to 15 gigahertz. And really, for memory, you're going to need, mm, let's go with one terabyte of memory. Obviously, I might be slightly exaggerating. It might need 512 gigabytes of memory. My point being that a lot of games seem to be really overblowing their specifications. And at the end of the day, I'm not saying you can run them on a toothpick, but you don't really need what they were saying a lot of the time. Especially for 1080p gaming. Yes, arguably, if you're going, say, I don't know, 4K or something along those lines, or even 1080p on a 14, oh, I'm sorry, 144 hertz, then certainly you're going to need the GPU power. But in a couple of years, it's going to be nuts. Um, and this is why, as a slight segue, I personally believe the next generation consoles, the PlayStation 5, are not going to be 2020. I personally believe it's going to be like 2017 we're going to start hearing rumours. I'm not saying I'm going to be right. Hey, if I'm wrong, it sucks. But I, I personally believe just because of the speed... The technology is moving over the next couple of years. It's absolutely crazy. We were kind of stalling 2013. Like, just take, go feel free to do some Googling on the GCN architecture, on the Kepler architecture to Maxwell. And, you know, basically from 2013, 2014, there were some okay improvements. 2015, it's been kind of, eh. 2016, yeah, it's going to be nice. But by the time 2017 and 18 come, I'm telling you, the performance is going to be crazy. Particularly because of 4K, um, 4K monitors, because of virtual reality, and everything else. And it's going to be pretty sweet. Anyway, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.